It may not be connected down there or something. Well, it would have to no, be. I know. Oh, well. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Let's see what happens. All right. We'll see if this works here in a second. All right. John chapter 1, and we'll verse 1 in just a moment. Uh, last week we began talking about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're doing a series on Bible doctrine. Um, it's so important that we understand who the person of Christ is. And uh, listen, if we get off on that, uh, then we, we get off, we'll get off on all kinds of things. Um, we have to have a solid foundation in regard to who the person of Christ is. And I know in some respects, I, I may be preaching to the choir this morning on some of this, as they say. Uh, but I don't take it for granted for new believers that they know these things. I don't want to take it for granted that, that the young people already know these things. Um, it's just come to my attention even more lately that if you don't have this, this solid foundation of, one, that this is the Bible, that this is the Word of God, and who the person of Christ is, that you, you will be led off into all kinds of different things. And so it's so important that we have that foundation in our life. Uh, last week in talking about Christ, we, we talked about the incarnation of Christ, Him coming in flesh. Uh, we talked about the supernatural birth of Christ, that He was born of a virgin. And we talked about the humanity of Christ. And, and we just highlighted some of the things about His life in regards that He truly was human, uh, but also God at the same time. Which leads us to the next thought that we're going to focus on this morning. And we're going to be talking about uh, the deity of Jesus Christ for a little while. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, we, we quoted this verse last week, but let's start with the reading of that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Father, help us, I pray, as we talk about your Son Jesus, and I pray that we would have a right understanding of who He is, what He did, and more of what He's going to do. Father, help us to believe the truth of who Jesus is, not whom we think Him to be or whom we even wish Him to be, but help us, Lord, by faith to believe that You are who You say You are and that Your Son is who He is. Father, I pray to that You'd help us to have this solid foundation in our life of who Christ is. In Jesus' name I pray, and amen. I do not know how many times I have been in discussion with people about spiritual things, or even about the, the, talking about different Bible passages and things, and after a long period of time of talking to them, I'm like, I'm very confused in talking to them, like, I, you believe this and you believe that, and they go off on all kinds of, of tangents, and then sometimes I come back to this reality where I just ask them this basic simple question who do you believe jesus is who do you believe jesus is and i come to find out that they don't believe that he is the christ that he is god in the flesh or or they don't believe may not believe in his virgin birth or they don't believe in an actual physical resurrection they get off on no, they're off on those things folks it's, it's very fundamental and basic foundational that we believe right about who jesus is uh, we, we, we talked about some of that last week and this week. I, I think we'll only do two weeks. And how can I sum up Christ in two weeks? Okay, I can't do that. So it's very basic. Our whole life is going to be about learning more of who He is. But these are some very basic teachings that we need to grasp and need to believe are very vital to the Christian faith. And in John 1, 1, where it says, In the beginning was a Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This passage shows how... how Jesus is God, and yet Jesus was with God at the same time. Um, two distinctions, yet at the same time, uh, one God. Turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 9. I may not get as far as I wanted to today with me not having the PowerPoint screen, uh, but we'll just see how far we get today. Uh, Romans chapter 9 and verse 5 says this. 
of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. When we speak about the deity of Christ, we're saying that Jesus Christ is God. And we make no apologies for that. We may not understand it because last week we looked at He also was human as well. He came and put upon Himself flesh. But Jesus Christ is God. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. But He is God. He's not created by the Father. He didn't start in any point of time of reference. He is God. In 1 John chapter 5, and I say this for, for many reasons, as I've already stated, you get off on some of these basic fundamentals, you, you get off on a lot of things. There are a lot of things that, that clothe themselves underneath the banner of Christianity, but are wrong on this that are wrong on the deity of Jesus Christ. Jehovah Witnesses being one of them. Mormons being another. And there's also all kinds of different flavors out there and pockets that, uh, that do not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, when you first talk to some of these, you might think that they do, but once you get in discussion, it's very obvious. They do not believe that Jesus is literally God. They might say that He's a God, or little g, something like that. But listen, Jesus Christ is God. Do you believe that? And I'm going to ask that question a few times throughout this lesson, and if we do two more weeks on it, I don't know. But do you believe that? Yes, amen. I hope, I hope you do. Um, 1 John 5 and verse 20 says this, And we know that the Son of God has come, and has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true. Listen, if you don't know who He is, you don't know what's true. If you don't know who He is, then you believe a lie. And we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God. You can't get any more descriptive and plain than that. I'm only picking out a couple of verses here. This is the true God and eternal life. If you do not believe that Jesus Christ is the true God, then you believe a falsehood. No matter how well people might clothe themselves with morality that stems from the Christian faith, if they do not believe that Jesus Christ is God, they believe a lie. And this is foundational. We must believe in who He is. Those who do not believe that God has come in the flesh and that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the anointed of God, the Bible teaches that they actually have the spirit of Antichrist. You see, the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, is Antichrist. In other words, it does not want us to believe in who Christ is. There's a lot of Old Testament passages that refer to God and are applied in the New Testament to the Son. Now, like I said, this is going to take me a little longer to get to um, without the PowerPoint. But Isaiah 40, I'll read some of these for you. Isaiah 40 and verse 3 says this. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That's in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. Now does that sound familiar to you? Well, if you know the Bible at all, you know that that's Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter uh, 3 and verse 3, He is uh, the one that John the Baptist proclaimed in the wilderness. And so He is the Lord, and He is God, in accordance to the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 40 and Christ fulfilling it in Matthew 3. Uh, turn also, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. 
verse 6 and 7, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Most people are familiar with that, right? And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name, and we know who it's talking about, right? A child is born, it's talking about Jesus. And his name will be called what? Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. You say, well, that doesn't make sense. You've got the Father and the Son. You remember Jesus being asked a question when he was down here on earth in John chapter 14? And, and, and Jesus, Jesus was asked a question by Thomas. He says, show us the Father, and it suffices us. I'm summarizing a little bit. And he said, oh, how long have I been with you? He said, if you've seen the, me, you have seen the Father. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of His government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over His kingdom to order it and establish it with just judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord, capital L, this is Jehovah, the zeal of the Lord Jehovah of hosts will perform this. And this was fulfilled in the person of Christ when you go over to the New Testament. In the book of Revelations in chapter 1, look at this description of Jesus. Go back to something that I said a little while ago. There are so many things that, that are robed in the garments of Christianity, the morality, people stand for, for issues of morality from the Bible. But whenever you hold to issues of morality, apart from who the person of Christ is, it's nothing more than, than Satan being clothed in light. Does that make sense? Satan doesn't mind to be moral if it attracts you and it keeps you away from who Christ is. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8 says this, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Well, now that sounds like a good description of God, right? Well, you study the context, guess who it is in chapter 1 when you read down through there. It is Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over all the kings of the earth. Verse 5. Jesus Christ is God. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the Lord. He is who was, is, and is to come. He is the Almighty. So I don't want to belabor this point too long, but there are, there are Old Testament passages that refer to God and apply to the Son of the New Testament. As we looked at, uh, there are attributes of Jesus Christ that you can find all through the Gospels that are attributes of God, attributes such as His eternity, His eternal essence, His omnipresence, His omniscience. His, he displayed His omniscience many times in His conversations here on earth. His omnipotence, we've seen that in His miracles. His self-existence, His immutability, His truth, love, holiness, all of these things are characteristics of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to do a full message on the Trinity, but we'll refer to it every now and then. Uh, but Jesus Christ, sometimes I'm talking about the Trinity. Some people, when trying to talk about it, they say things like, well, God the Father created, and God the Son. Oh, you've, already, you've already messed up. <laughs> you have already messed up um, when you think like that. Uh, when, you, when you look back in Genesis 1, you, you see actually all three persons in the Godhead at work. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did He create them? God said. Who is the Word? Jesus is the Word. What happened when there was darkness over the face of the earth? The Spirit moved upon it. I mean, there's all three persons in the Godhead there. But Jesus Christ is Creator. And it's important that you understand that because a lot of times when, when people try to disprove the deity of Christ, that He's God, they, they say, well, He's not Creator. God the Father, He, God Almighty, He's the Creator. Listen, Jesus Christ is Creator. It's found 
uh, there in, in, in John chapter 1 when it talks about Christ. It's found in many places. Um, in John 1, 3, I'll go ahead and read that. In John 1 and verse 3, It says, all things were made uh, through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Well, who's it talking about? Well, it's talking about Jesus. You read on down through there, uh, you find out that John bore witness of this person. It is Jesus. Jesus Christ made all things. Nothing was made without Him. Another good verse I like to read is in Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Listen, when you talk to people who get off on a lot of things and uh, you have to bring them back to who Christ is, uh, many times when I talk to people like Jehovah Witnesses or Mormons, that they want to take you down all kinds of rabbit trails. They want to talk about the environment or, or talk about all kinds of, of, of issues. And they can get you sidetracked and get caught up in talking about some of those things. And some of those things you might even agree with them uh, on. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get you to agree with them on a few things. And they're, they're really, they're wolves in sheep's clothing. Um, they deny who Christ is, so you've got to bring them back to that. Uh, Hebrews 1 and verse 8, notice what's said here. But to the Son, He says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. There we see that the, the, the Father and Son there. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And who has anointed Him? It says, your, therefore, your God, your God. As I cannot explain the Trinity. But the Trinity is taught in the Word of God, and therefore, I believe it. Jesus Christ is God, manifested in the flesh, we may say the second person of the Godhead. Jesus Christ in the New Testament, He receives honor and worship that is due to God alone. Listen, if He's not God, then He's a fraud. All right? If He's not God, He's a fraud. Because He received worship when He was here upon this earth that belonged to God alone. And the Father and Son, we are taught in the Word of God, actually receive equal honor. He did not mind receiving that worship. The Son is worshipped and exalted as God. Glory is ascribed to Christ as God. Jesus is declared to be the express image of God. Listen, I don't understand all of that. But I do believe, that, and I believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Now again, why, why is this so important, we may ask? Well listen, as we said, those who deny the essential deity of Christ are to be marked as having the spirit of Antichrist in accordance to the Word of God in 1 John 2.22 and 2 John verses 7-9. through 9. When people are denying the deity of Christ, they're denying that He is the Christ. You have to make that connection. Alright, I spent long enough on that, I think. No, I didn't. Never mind. Aha. Um... When we think of Jesus Christ and how could He be both God and man in one body, of course it is a mystery to us. We're, I'm not going to explain it. And honestly, it's one of those things where I feel like if I talk very long about it, I'm just going to say something wrong. Because <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's it is a mystery to understand how God came in the flesh. Um, I really like this quote by Sam Storms, and he doesn't really clarify anything or clear it up for you but it just shows the, just the mystery and the amazement of Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. He said this, He was conceived by the union of divine grace and human disgrace. He, was, he who breathed the breath of life into the first man is now himself a man, breathing his first breath. The king of kings now sleeping in a cow pen, the creator of oceans and seas and rivers, afloat in the womb of his mother, God sucking his thumb, the Alpha and Omega learning his multiplication tables. I don't know. 
He who was once surrounded by the glorious seraphonic praise of adoring angels, now hears the lowing of cattle, the bleeding of sheep, the stammering of bewildering shepherds. He who spoke the universe into being now coos and cries. Omniscient deity counting his toes. <laughs> From the robes of eternal glory to the rags of swaddling clothes. The omnipresent spirit whose being fills the galaxies confined to the womb of a peasant, peasant girl. Infinite power learning to crawl. It's just random stuff. I mean, it's like... That, those thoughts blow my mind away. We can't understand that. God in the flesh. Now I think that because of that incomprehensibility of this great, blessed, and necessary truth that we must believe, because of its mystery, people don't believe it. Like you can't explain it. Well, that's where faith must come in, folks. There's so many things in the Bible I'm not going to be able to explain. I don't need scientific proof to believe the Bible. Listen, how can you prove by science, I mean real science, observable, how can you prove by science that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh and was born of a virgin? Science, science must be tested and tried and observed. I can't do that. <laughs> it is a matter of faith, not a matter of intellect. Not a matter of intellect. It's a matter of faith. And what we've said about Christ and His humanity, His deity, and that He is the Son of God and God, do you believe that? Well, let me tell you something wonderful this morning. If you know who Christ is, if you say, well, I can't explain it, but I, I, I believe it, preacher. I believe that. When Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus told him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father, which is in heaven. Folks, we, we can reason with people and try to explain it to people, but it comes right down to it. Their eyes must be opened. They must have them revealed Christ unto them. God must do that. I can try to explain it and, and show the Bible, but God must open their eyes to who he is, and who His Son is. And if you this morning know who Jesus is, blessed are you. Your eyes have been opened. Not everyone you know knows. And not everyone you see sees. God has made Himself known unto you in the person of Christ. It's a blessed thing to know Christ. And if you know Him and know these things that we're talking about, say, I know that preacher, I know that. How blessed you are. Not everybody does. <laughs> but you can see. Let us move on to more things here about Christ. We, we touched on this a little bit on Wednesday night. On Wednesdays, I want to encourage you to come. We're going through the Sermon on the Mount. I'm really enjoying it. I know other people have said they, they are enjoying it as well. Uh, but turn to Matthew 5. We're going, on, we're going to leave the doctrine there, the deity of Christ, for a moment. Uh, Matthew 5, verse 17, Jesus said this. Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle, but by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. I want to talk about the life, sacrifice, and resurrection of Christ. First of all, Jesus Christ, not only was He conceived and, and born sinless, as we've seen already in our last message, but He's the only man to live in a complete harmony and conformity 
to the holy law, the only one. He states in these verses that he came to fulfill the law. Romans 5.19 says, For as by one man's disobedience, the first Adam, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Listen, if, if you don't believe that Jesus Christ was completely righteous, that He never sinned, you're probably off on who He was. I, I've seen this just recently, someone who's confused about who Jesus Christ is. They also believe that He did not keep the law perfectly. You see, they all tie together. How could he keep the law perfectly? How could he fulfill all the law? Because he is the lawgiver himself. He is the perfect one, the holy one. Listen, we, we can be made righteous today through Christ because he fulfilled all of that law. He lived a completely righteous life. He, he had no guilt of sin in thought, word or deed. I absolutely love, I tell you, if you want to memorize a good verse, let me give you one right now. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. Tell a preacher, have you memorized it because you're turning to it? No, actually, I, I did it at one point and I was afraid to try to quote it right now. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin, he knew no sin, That's inwardly, outwardly, he knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Hebrews says that Jesus was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 7 says, For such an high priest became us who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens. Now because Christ fulfilled all of the law and kept all the precepts of the law and did it on our behalf, we are declared righteous through faith in Christ. How can you be righteous in God's sight if you are not righteous of your own? It's through another one, one who has taken your place, who knew no sin, who became sin for us. He received our sin upon His body on the tree, and by faith in Him, we receive His righteousness. It's imputed unto us. It's given unto us. Philippians 3, 9 says, And be found in Him, Paul says this, Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Listen, you have got to be righteous completely to go to heaven. 100% righteous. Because you don't have that. You have failed miserably. We all have. You need the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus Christ, believing that He lived that perfect life that you cannot live and died in your place a sacrificial death and rose again. That's the only way to be, to be declared righteous. Jerry Bridges said this, There would be absolutely no benefit to us if Jesus merely lived and died as a private person. It is only because He lived and died as our representative that His work becomes beneficial to us. And I refer to this at the close of last week, that the gospel is more than, than believing that Jesus lived, died, and rose again. The gospel is believing that He did that for you. That's the gospel message that I have to believe to be saved. That's a gospel message you must believe to be saved. How that Christ died what for our sins. He's the perfect one, the sinless one, took our place. And that's what we get to next regarding the sacrificial death of Christ. Turn to 1 Peter, if you would, chapter 3. Because Jesus had to die in order to secure the salvation of all those that He came to save. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, 
being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. He died the just for the unjust. He, he was the law one. He was the law giver who died for the lawless ones. He was the righteous one dying for the unrighteous. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins, the message of substitution. In His death, the Lord Jesus suffered the equivalent in what the elect would have suffered in the lake of fire throughout all eternity. Isaiah 53 says, He has borne our griefs. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. All the judgment that we deserved as the people of God was laid on the Savior. And Christ bore that curse and condemnation in order to redeem us. I like what Henry Smith said. He said, He hideth our righteous unrighteousness with His righteousness. He covereth our disobedience with His obedience. He shadoweth our death with His death that the wrath of God cannot find us. There on the cross of Calvary, as we referred to last week, Christ was there hanging on the cross. I believe the wrath of the Father was coming down upon Him. And He bore the judgment of hell for us. And hell is total darkness. And for those three hours, there was three hours of darkness on the cross. And during those three hours, Jesus Christ cried out what? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That will be the, what lost people in hell will be crying out through all eternity. They will know they are banished, if you would, from the very presence of God. Listen, everything about hell is going to be horrific. But I assure you, one of the worst things about hell is going to be the reality that you are eternally forsaken by God and that there is no sense of hope or second chances. That's going to be terrible. But after Jesus Christ there bore that on the cross of Calvary, after He cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And bore the wrath of the Father there on our behalf. He cried out one of the wonderful things that's, that's ever been stated on the cross. Three words in, in our English language, but only one word in the Greek. It is finished. All in one word. It is finished. What is finished? Matthew 1, 21, For you shall call His name Jesus, for He shall save His people from their sins. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It is finished. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In whom Christ we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. And so there, God came in the flesh, lived a perfect life, a sinless life, died on the cross of Calvary. But it's not the end of the story. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Christ was prophesied in Psalm 16.10 where it reads, For you will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. That passage is quoted uh, by Peter on the day of Pentecost and Paul also used that passage to preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ taught many times that He would rise again. He said, you can destroy this body, but in three days I will raise it up again. The angels gave witness to His resurrection. The apostles and at least 500 others seen Him after He resurrected. A great book, The Case for Christ, actually goes back in, in history and talks about other witnesses. Very, very good book and, and how much proof there was of even the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But again, I don't need the words of affirmation from men. I have the Word of God. I believe that by faith. The fact of His resurrection in His body is not anything that can be debated in the Scriptures. Now there were some that would, again, that would claim to believe in Jesus. They'll, they'll, they'll adhere to the name at least in idea but who deny His deity or who may deny the physical resurrection. And that's very, so interesting to me because that connection between those who deny the physical resurrection of Christ 
deny his deity. Romans 1 and verse 3 says this, He's declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Great verse that connects who He is and the resurrection. The resurrection declared Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The resurrection of Christ declared who He was and His holiness. Now, what is the life and sacrifice of Christ if indeed He did not rise again? In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul teaches us that we are of all men most miserable and that life is vain. Our faith is vain. If Jesus Christ did not rise again from the dead, all of this is pointless. He is dead. Our hope is dead with Him. C.H. Spurgeon said this, Upon a life I did not live, upon a death I did not die. I risked eternity on the resurrection. John Boyd said this, The resurrection of Christ is the amen to all of His promises. I like that because what else in the Word of God can possibly be true? What can we hang our hat on, if you would, if Jesus Christ did not rise again? What's the point in reading Revelation? What's the point in any of that? If He's dead, He's dead. Revelation is, is not going to happen. He's not going to come back if He's dead. All the promises, everything we, we hope in is based upon who Jesus Christ is, what He did on this earth. He lived a perfect life, died in our place, rose again, and now, according to Acts 1, 9-11, has ascended upon high. Let's turn to one more verse. I'm actually going to rush through the last part of this. Acts chapter 1. So Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. Well, where is He now? Well, he's not, he's not walking around right now physically. I believe uh, the Lord's Spirit is in, in the church and those kind of things. Uh, we have the Holy Spirit in us, but Jesus Christ physically, physically is at the right hand of the Father. He has ascended. He didn't come back in A.D. 70. Okay? Say, what and why did he say that? If you don't know why I said that, that's probably a good thing. All right? Um, Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things, Jesus, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Could you imagine that? Just being there. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, I mean, I imagine they just kept looking. You know, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in the like manner as you saw him go into heaven. You ever, you ever seen a, a balloon released or, or something going up in the sky like that and you just keep watching it, see how long you can see it? I imagine that's what they did. I mean, they seen Jesus go up. They just keep watching and watching and watching and watching. I think I still see him. I think I still see him. And it's like, I can't see him anymore. They're, they're just still just looking. Maybe, maybe waiting for him to appear again. You know, where's he at? Is he gone? What's now? What's happening now? And so these... Angels, no doubt, what they were, tell him, tell them that in the same manner he's going to come back. I'm looking forward to that day. <laughs> Mark recorded his ascension in, in 16, 19. Jesus taught he would ascend in, six, in John 6, 62. His ascension is declared every time the Scriptures talk about Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. That's where Jesus is at right now. He's ascending to heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father, serving as, uh, as our high priest, as His believers, as His people. The ascension of Christ is not just necessary in order for Him to perform His duties as our high priest at the right hand of the Father, but it's a constant reminder that He has ascended, that He's gained a victory over death, hell, and the grave. Jesus Christ is going to come back in like manner that He went up. Now, I'm not going to get into this in, in this message here. Maybe we'll take some time to deal with this in, in greater detail later, some other time. But um, it's important for us to understand the offices of Christ. I'm just going to refer to these in just, in just a couple minutes here. 
Um, Jesus Christ, oftentimes you might hear him referred to as prophet. Uh, he is prophet, and, but he's not just a prophet. Um, when, sometimes Jesus would say, well, who do men say I am? Some would say, well, prophet. Well, he was prophet. He was prophesied to be a prophet. He is prophet, but he's more than a prophet. Um, when Jesus fed the 5,000, it says that they said this, this is of a truth, that prophet that would come into the world. Uh, when Jesus was here upon this earth, the Father made it clear that he was the mouthpiece of heaven by speaking from heaven and saying, Hear ye him. Let me say this, Jesus is the prophet that we are to listen to now. We have the word of God that tells us about who Jesus is. I, I think you have to connect uh, Hebrews, if you would, chapter 1 with this. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, God who at various times and in various ways spoken time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by His Son whom He has anointed heir of all things through, through whom also He made the worlds. Jesus Christ is the final prophet, if you would, that God has spoken to us through. Secondly, Jesus is not only prophet, but He's priest. We've already referred to that. He is our high priest, sitting at the right hand of the Father. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle, He's also called an apostle, and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. You know, I love, I love thinking about the ministry of Christ, not only here on this earth, but what He's doing right now. Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father, on our behalf, making intercession for us. I may forget to pray for you like I ought, but I know one who does not ever, ever forget to pray for you. I've been greatly comforted at many times in my life when I have been unable to pray. I'm trying to talk to God and pray to the Lord and I can be so overwhelmed with life and what's going on and I can just pray this and it comforts me every time when I just say these words and meditate on it and just be silent for a moment. Sometimes I can just be overwhelmed, not know what to pray, and I just pray, Lord Jesus, pray to the Father for me for what I need. And just be silent. And just bask in that reality of what's taking place in glory. Because I really believe that's happening. Because that's what the Bible teaches. I don't hear it. I didn't hear a voice, didn't hear Jesus, didn't hear what He prayed for me. But I believe it. And that strengthens your faith to know that and to have that. I love this quote by Robert Murray. <laughs> this will get you excited. He said, If I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Imagine if you actually could hear it. Imagine with your audible ears that, that you could hear Jesus praying for you. But you listen, he wanted to say, yet it makes no difference if I hear him or not. He is praying for me. Let me tell you what. You can, one of these days soon, we're going to look into John chapter 17. We did it a few years ago and we did John, but we want to focus in on the high priestly prayer and what Jesus is praying for us right now at the right hand of the Father. He is our high priest. He's prophet. He's the final word. He is our high priest. He's at the right hand of the Father. And lastly, Jesus Christ. Do not forget this one. He is prophet. He is priest. And He is king. Amen. I'm glad somebody said it. Jesus Christ is king to reign in us and over us. Listen, for He is not just Jesus. He's more than a Savior. He's not just Jesus Christ. He's more than a Savior and the Son of God. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our Savior that was sent to rule and reign over us. He is, Jesus is, Lord of lords and King of kings. You must believe in who He is and what He's done. If you do not, I assure you, one day every knee will bow, and that will be your knee. And every tongue will confess, that will be your tongue who will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You will bow. You will confess to who He is one day. 
and all the blasphemers that deny Him, fight against Him, they will bow one day. All those who've said He's not the Christ, He's not God, He's not who He said He was, they will bow before Him and they will acknowledge who He is. And, but it'll be too late. <laughs> it'll be too late. You need to know who He is. Surrender to Him. Believe upon Him today. What He did on the cross died, rose again, ascended, believes the message of the gospel. He did that for your sins, because if you don't, you die and go to hell. And that's reality. And I don't want that for anybody. Repent of your sins and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's good news. It's the best news I can give you today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, please work in hearts present, Lord, to draw each one close to you. Help us to see Jesus. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would reveal, make known, illuminate, take the blinders off of eyes, unplug ears, help people to hear and to see the truth of who Jesus is, that they will know that it was not flesh and blood right now, my words, that have made that known unto them but they will know that you, O oh Father from heaven, have made yourself known through the person of your Son, Jesus Christ. Open their eyes to see. May their eyes be blessed today to know who Christ is and what He did on behalf of sinners. We pray in Jesus' name and amen. That's all.